Hey everybody, so exciting module coming up, consumer behavior. I think it's something that's easily relatable because we're all consumers and we all behave when we make our purchasing decisions. So um, I know a lot of you were also interested in this for your final presentation. So here's my presentation on consumer behavior. Um, the idea of whatever we look to buy, how we buy it, where we buy it, how we use it, how we review it or evaluate it, how we even dispose of it is all part of consumer behavior. It doesn't have to be a hard product. It can be a service. Uh, it can be um, you know, a vacation, as you see here, something like that. Um, so there's all kinds of decisions that we need to make. So let's take a look. So one of the classic um, models here is this problem solution. Right, so you have a problem and the product comes to the rescue. Um, it might be something like out of stock. You know, you open the fridge, there's no milk for your coffee. I gotta go down to the deli and buy a container of milk. Dissatisfaction, uh, the car won't start. It broke down on the highway, I need a new car. Um, new needs, new wants. You move into a new apartment, a new house. You gotta get new furniture, you gotta get new appliances related uh, products or services that might go with it. Um, you buy a new Mac. Hey, you're gonna need a case. You're gonna need some headphones. Marketer induced. Uh, do you have no energy? Maybe you need to buy our energy product. Um, or just new products, like gotta have it. You know, iPhone 19, yeah, you know, I'm gonna definitely you know, get rid of all my old iPhones as soon as the new one comes out because I gotta have the latest and the greatest. So the idea of motivation, what makes you want to make that purchase decision? Um, it might be some of those things we talked about before. Um, let's take a look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So a lot of this relates to psychology. Um, and I think that Maslow is a great example of, you know, how psychology kind of goes into these uh, purchase decisions. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, the first base of this pyramid is the idea of physiological needs. So hunger or thirst, the idea that you need uh, food, water, you need to breathe. Uh, in order to you know, go and make those purchases, you need to be first alive. So the next thing is safety needs. So something like security and protection. Maybe you need you know, a winter coat or you need to pay the rent so you don't get thrown out of your apartment. The next thing is the social needs. So this is something like, you know, new sneakers so I can, you know, be cool with my friends. Um, the next thing is esteem needs. So this is like self-esteem, recognition, status, maybe uh, that new Tesla or the greatest uh, makeup styles. And then finally, self-actualization. So this is the high end. This is like the higher ground. You know, the idea that, you know, I'm going to take AC 111 and uh, become, uh, you know, new, have a new career in marketing or maybe a philosophy class or something like that, right? So your higher, higher needs. So here is another kind of model here, and we'll spend a little time on this, the idea of, again, problem recognition. So, you know, we talked a little bit about that. The next thing is the, um, well, I'm gonna use this example here. So my laptop broke. So the next thing I'm gonna do is my information search, right? So I have a broken laptop, so what am I gonna do now? I'm gonna search and see what I'm gonna do. So maybe I'll look at, uh, you know, some Google reviews for new computers and see, you know, what one is gonna, uh, meet my needs or strike my fancy. So the next stage is this alternative evaluation. So that means, well, is it going to be, you know, the Mac, the PC, the Chromebook? Which one is going to fulfill my needs the best? Um, so I have to think about all those things. And then the next phase is my purchase decision. So here I'm going to end up maybe in the Apple store and I'm going to actually buy the computer. And then I'm gonna move into the next phase, which is the post-purchase evaluation. So here's where, you know, if it was a Mac, I'll probably be very, very happy and kind of impressed with the new features. 
Uh, but it also could be negative, right? It might be, oh, gee, you know, the battery doesn't last as long as I thought it did, or um, I can't uh, connect to the internet the way I thought I could, so there may be problems with it. Um, so if we look at the second model here that looks more at the psychological um, evaluations for a purchase, the first stage is, again, our motivation. Okay, so uh, I'm taking AC111 uh, and I need to have a computer because it's an online class. Um, the next thing is perception. So perception is an interesting one. I'm going to look at it a little bit more. But the idea of the, you know, the computer itself, right, the sensations, you know, the keyboard, the, the feel of it, the look of the screen, the retina display, how it looks, um, all those things are things that I'm going to be evaluating for my purchase. The next thing is attitude formation. So this might be, you know, things like um, some beliefs that I have, so, uh, you know, that maybe Macs are cooler than PCs. <laughs> we looked at that earlier on in one of the modules. Um, I might get these attitudes also from my uh, friends who own computers or uh, reading reviews and things like that. So um, the next thing is integration. So here's where I'm going to kind of like put all those pieces together and kind of weigh the balance. I'll say things like, well, gee, you know, this one is cheaper, but, you know, even if, I, if I'm going to go with a Mac, I might, you know, say, well, you know, which one can I afford? Which one has the screen size that I want? You know, do I want the Air? Do I want the Pro? Um, all those kind of things. And then learning is this idea of, you know, my experience with the actual computer um, so I could say something like, you know, my, my, my last Mac, Mac never crashed on me. It always turned on, lasted for years. Um, so but I could have also negative learning things like maybe, you know, the battery went on fire or something like that. So, um, again, this is kind of like the experience you're going to have with the product and uh, might influence your next purchase decision. So here's an example that uh, kind of exemplifies two different needs that are being met here. So the Toyota ad talks about safety. So drive around in this car, you know, you're going to be safe. Maybe you have young children, you want to, you know, be safe in the car. Whereas you could also go with the self-actualization. I'm going to go for the high-end luxury Jaguar, and that might be more associated with other ideals, right? So being, you know, the slickest car in the lot and, you know, impressing your friends with it, that kind of feel. So... Again, getting back to this psychoanalytic theory of how we buy things and how we are motivated to make the choice that we choose, a lot of it is based on our psychology and our past experiences, um, maybe something that happened to you when you were younger. Um, you couldn't have a certain thing and then you wanted it. I put Rosebud there, if you know the connotation of Citizen Kane, right, where he... Uh, you know, didn't get the sled that he wanted as a child, but then, you know, he always was very motivated then to get what he wanted afterwards. Um, so these psychoanalytic techniques, obviously the father of psychoanalysis is Sigmund Freud. Um, they may be a little bit more abstract, obviously, for people to get a handle on and how true they are, um, you know, may not be exactly, uh, you know, the easiest thing to grasp. Uh, I'm going to take a step back here a little sidestep and just talk a little bit about the Ross model of communication. So this is the idea of um, a sender, we're going to say our advertiser, and then our receiver, our consumer. And you know the idea of a message, right, traveling on some type of media. So maybe we have a video message or a video ad on YouTube, right? So we have some type of message, it's video, it's traveling on some type of medium. We got to think about, you know, how our consumers are actually uh, being in touch with that medium, you know, where they are, we want to reach them. And when that message or that video is recorded and edited, it is encoded in a certain way. So there's certain language and there's certain things like, you know, are we using cuts? Are we using dissolves? Are we using fast cuts? Are we blurring the image? All kinds of things like that that kind of encode the image that um, tell people, you know, kind of messages about it. 
So um, I'm encoding a message right now by using the English language. Okay, and the idea is that in order for you to decode that message, you need to understand English. So we have some type of mutual influence or mutual experience. If I continue the lecture in another language, it may not be hard, it may be hard to understand, right? So the idea that we have to have some type of shared experience there. Um, and that's where a lot of advertisers may miss the call, right? So uh, here's a little Easter egg for you. Um, can you tell me why the uh, GMC Nova didn't do well in the Latin American market? The Nova um, did really well in America, but then when they tried to sell it in uh, South America and Latin America, um, didn't sell too well. Tell me why and uh, you'll get the Easter egg for this lesson. Um, so what else is going on here? We also have this idea of feedback. So feedback is where you know you uh, the uh, content creator will look at the YouTube channel and do the analysis and see, oh gee, I didn't get many hits. Why not? Maybe I don't have the right thumbnail to attract people. Um, so the idea of feedback being either positive or negative. Positive may mean oh sales just went through the roof. We need to manufacture more widgets or cars or whatever it is. So uh, we have that feedback loop. There's some things that aren't in this diagram. One is um, noise. So what could be noise here? Noise is interference with the message. So maybe some of it is unwanted, you know, like maybe during uh, my YouTube thing, uh, a commercial comes up, right? So that would interrupt the uh, flow of the commercial. Uh, another thing would be uh, the content creator's camera was out of focus. So I couldn't really see the package design on the product and therefore I couldn't find it when I went into the retail establishment. Okay, so um, hopefully that kind of, you know, and this, this actually works for any kind of communication, whether it's face-to-face uh, -face or something like this or a, a TV ad or a radio commercial, a print ad. You're always thinking about, you know, who's your target audience? What is their experience? How am I going to reach them through a certain channel? Eliminate the noise. Uh, get their feedback and then use that feedback to refine the message um, so that it continually is effective. Um, okay. So here again we have this idea of why people are going to buy a certain thing. So, you know, I could buy a real uh, kind of practical car or I could buy this, you know, monster racing car that looks like, you know, it's going to cost a lot of money and, um, you know, it's kind of again the psychographics of why I would buy that car over a you know good solid you know Toyota or a Honda or something like that. Um, you know uh, I want to impress people obviously with this car. I want to feel uh, like a status symbol. Uh, but then again, I have to weigh all these other things in there. Like, gee, this looks like it's going to be really expensive to not only. Uh, purchase but also maintain and you know where am I going to park it and it looks like if I go over a pothole it's so low to the ground so there's all kinds of reasons why you know we would kind of make up our um, purchase here um, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about some more of them as we work our way through um, so here's a uh, you know just this actually should have been closer to the Freudian slide Here's our, you know, kid with the paper plane and I actually generated this image with an AI image generator. I just put, you know, boy with paper plane and, uh, you know, he grew up, he became a pilot and bought himself a, you know, Cessna plane or something like that. So um, just the idea that, again, this psychological evaluation I mentioned was not that clear. Okay, so this um, image slide here looks at, again, how a brand would use certain tools. So it might be a survey, right? It might be an interview. Here's the interview process. Or it might be a focus group where we bring people together and, you know, here's a bottle of Coke in there. We all, you know, give them a bottle of Coke and say, gee, how do you like the new flavor or the new recipe? And uh, they're all kind of making notes saying, you know, it's very good, too sweet, you know, not sweet enough, not fizzy enough, whatever it is. So, uh, you know, from this sample, then we can make inferences about how we want to uh, advertise the product or even, you know, change the formula. Um, so some type of kind of research, right? These are the ideas of using marketing research. 
um, all types of uh, testing kind of things, uh, association tests, you know, maybe where I just sit someone down and say something like new car. And they'll say, you know, Toyota, or they'll say Porsche, uh, and you know, get the idea of what they're looking for: fast, uh, slick, uh, luxury, you know, those kind of things. So, you know, what people are, are, you know, getting top of mind like that in an association test can really kind of reveal a lot of things about uh, their consumer behavior. Okay, so um, the idea here is then um, I'm gonna you know do my information searches. I need a new car. I may do uh, an internal search. You know, past experiences. Uh, my dad had a sports car that you know I really used to love to drive around in. Um, other things like alternatives. You know, can I buy this car new? Can I lease it? Can I buy it used? You know, and weighing all those things in the balance then. And then doing an external search. So I might, you know, uh, kind of look at the website for BMW. Or I can go into a marketer controlled source, like walk into a BMW showroom and uh, experience the personal selling that I would have with a salesperson. And then my own personal experience would be then to take the car out for a test drive, right? So where I could actually experience it firsthand and have the personal experience of you know, shifting the gears or, uh, you know, hitting the brakes and getting a real feel for just how the car handles and, um, you know, how it would really, you know, kind of perform for me. And just to continue that, you know, the idea that, you know, you guys know how to get reviews, you know, you can go online, you can, you know, you want to go to a restaurant, you look at some of the Yelp reviews, you talk to your friends, um, there's all types of, you know, everybody's got something to say, so recommendations. You got to evaluate them, how true they are. I know a lot of times when I look on Amazon, you can kind of tell, well, this looks like a fake review, right? <laughs> looks like it was written by the owner or something like that. Um, and uh, your information search may also have other factors too, right? So there are some things like, you know, you might buy every day and you don't even think about it. You know, it's a small ticket item, cup of coffee, a few dollars, uh, as long as you don't go to Starbucks. Uh, or it might be a big ticket item where, you know, it's a really big decision. You're going to buy a $40,000 SUV. You want to take your time, obviously, and do a little bit more research with a purchase like that. Um, what are the risks? You know, maybe if I buy that used model, it might break down right away. Or even if it's a new model, it could be a lemon, right? And then things like deadlines, time available. So class starts tomorrow, so I need that car to get to work or get to class, or I need that computer to start the class because um, it's a short class and I don't want to be there without, you know, my computer. So lots of other kind of external factors and things like that that might influence my search. The next thing is one of my favorites, the idea of perception. So, you know, again, in the showroom, right, looking at all these gorgeous cars. Well, this example looks at uh, orange juice. And I think we, we looked at that in the earlier lecture too, the idea of, you know, you walk into the supermarket, there's a wall of orange juice there. Which one are you going to pick? Um, so um, the idea of perception is using your senses, you know. So uh, when you look at the product, what does it look like? You know, what does it smell like? Maybe you can't open up the orange juice and smell it in the, uh, but you can certainly look at it. And uh, obviously, if you take it home, you can smell it and you can taste it. And, um, you know, just the idea of the color is orange and the package itself, you know, so look at this nice, uh, it's actually called a premium carafe, you know, for pouring. It's kind of elegant. Maybe I'll even save it and put water in it afterwards or refill it, you know, so just the idea of all the kind of sensory perception that I would get from the actual article. And, uh, you know, obviously this is what uh, retail is really strong at, you know, so you might not get it, you know, kind of browsing through Amazon, but when you walk into a retail store, you can have a little bit more tactile experience with um, the product and get a real feel for it. Okay. Um, 
you know, again, looking at this, the idea of uh, using co coffee again as the example, perception, mood, you know, you might just say to yourself, uh, you know, I need a break, I need a coffee break, I'm in the mood for a, you know, a nice hot coffee, it's cold out. So there's lots of different factors that influence that decision. You might say, well, I need to, you know, get more energy, that's why I need the coffee. So, uh, and then, you know, obviously walking into Starbucks, you've got all kinds of other decisions that you've got to make, you know, do I want, uh, you know, cream, do I want foam, do I want, you know, syrup, uh, what size do I want, you know, is it light roast, dark roast, all those kind of things. So again, so many different decisions that will actually go into your, you know, uh, and, you know, maybe you didn't want a cup of coffee, but as you walk past Starbucks, you just got a whiff of that coffee. So it might be that immediate direct response like, gee, that smells good. I'm going to go in and get a cup. Okay, um, selective, um, this is the idea of selective exposure, attention, comprehension, and retention. So the whole idea about selective is, you know, maybe uh, I know I'm going to buy a Mac, but I'll still look at the PCs, but really the idea is like when I'm walking through, you know, say Best Buy and they're all there, I only got my eyes on the Mac. You know, I'm only really paying attention to the Mac. I'm only really looking at the features of the Mac. When I walk out of there and I didn't buy it, I'm saying to myself, gee, those Macs really look great. I got to go back. So the idea that, you know, I'm kind of uh, already, you know, uh, in the tribe and making that decision even before. So I'm going to kind of wear blinders and not really look at the other brands. Um... Coca-Cola, you know, the idea of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm making a cola choice. A lot of times Coke is synonymous with cola, right? People will say, I'll have a Coke. Uh, Pepsi, okay, you know, but, you know, you, you really would walk in and order a cola, right? You know, you don't know what you're going to get, but um, at least, you know, the idea that, you know, Coke has this association and here's an ad where they don't even have to have their name on it. You know, it's just that color that kind of brings you in that kind of, uh, you know, it's almost like they own that color. Okay, I think this is just a kind of review of this idea of selective comprehension, the idea that, you know, you're only going to kind of look at what you're already interested in. So talking about subliminal perception, this is actually very interesting. I should have animated this slide a little bit, but um, this is a uh, board game that um, was uh, marketed in the 70s, and uh, they were accused by the, uh, the uh, Federal Communications uh, Commission of using a kind of underhanded tactic where as you were watching the commercial, there was one frame in video, there were 30 frames a second. So there was just one frame, which meant that you really couldn't see it, you know, but subliminally it said, get it. Um, and of course, I, you might know the, the story of, you know, a lot of uh, films when you went to the movies, they would put in the film trailer or something like that, a frame of popcorn. So, and they found that when they did this, uh, the concession stand was more crowded, you know, during intermission. So people would you know, not really see it, you know, but um, they would subconsciously say, hey, gee, I need a Coke or I need a, you know, a, a, a thing of popcorn. So here's um, a racing car with this kind of barcode on there. And the barcode kind of looks like uh, the Marlboro. So again, the uh, FCC wouldn't let them put the cigarette advertising on the race car. But what they did is put this kind of barcode version and actually they were asked to cease and desist. Um, here's one for you. So see if you can see anything subliminally going on here in this uh, Gilby's Gin ad. How about this right here? S E X. All right. So again, building that in there. It's kind of purposely in there. You know, obviously today you could do this uh, with a Photoshop kind of thing, uh, kind of build it in there. Um, the other idea then is, you know, competitive evaluation. So the idea that, okay, I'm in the coffee aisle and I'm looking for that coffee. Which one am I going to get? Um, the uh, idea of having an evoked set. So an evoked set means that when I go to buy coffee, it's going to be one of these six, you know. So, you know, it may not always be uh, chock full of nuts, 
Uh, sometimes I'm in the mood for something a little bit more, you know, high end or something like that. But the idea is whenever I'm looking for coffee, I have an evoke set. So a lot of marketers want to be in that kind of top of mind thing. Uh, and the way they do that is by having a schedule of advertising. So they're always kind of in your face. Um, you know, you, you can't just stop advertising. You have to kind of continue and kind of service the account a little bit and make sure that you're always going to be top of mind that people don't forget about you. So you're always in that evoked set. Here's another influence that might, uh, you know, so here is this guy, you know, saying to himself, gee, you know, I got all these Keurig things and, uh, you know, maybe he's thinking about sustainability. Um, um, so I'm kind of evaluating my, my purchase, you know, um, I can think about things like uh, price versus style. So am I more concerned about price or am I more concerned about style or how am I going to kind of balance those things? So uh, do I want to do, you know, the most expensive Keurig or, you know, or, or more basic model? Um, and then the idea of what services do it have? So what's, what's the advanced features that would make me go for the more expensive one? And here, you know, I want to talk a little bit about this other tangible kind of uh, experience by the consumer. So yeah, you know, it is easy to use, but it does produce a lot of waste. And then you might say, well, I want to get the model that allows me to use, you know, my own uh, paper, uh, you know, filters here. But then, you know, those end up in the landfill too. So I might want to go with a totally reusable plastic model. Um, and then I could also say to myself, gee, I don't want my hot coffee touching the plastic. So again, lots of different reasons why I would uh, kind of tailor or evolve my decision um, when I'm, uh, you know, kind of in that, you know, stage of the purchase. Okay, so then all of the, uh, you know, kind of after purchase maybe things or things I'm going to evaluate, you know, uh, is this really going to make me happy, right? You know, when I buy this car, is it going to be, you know, all it's kind of uh, chalked up to be? Is it going to be the one that's going to get me friends and uh, make me look cool? Or am I going to be servicing it all the time and paying lots of money? So there's all types of kind of consequences. People may look at that big Cadillac and say, gee, you know, what a gas guzzler. Or, um, you know, they may say, well, gee, that color is just beautiful. It just, you know, it's that color is so you, right? So there's all kinds of, um, you know, other factors here that would influence um, the purchase decision. And also, um, you know, uh, it could be things that you're not even aware of that kind of come up later. Maybe I should have chosen in red. Um, so then a really strong thing that brands, you know, have to work really hard at is this idea of attitudes. And this again goes, you know, to the line of public relations, you know, what is the brand's uh, philosophy, what is their kind of mission statement, how are they treating things like uh, equity and ethics and sustainability, are they paying their workers, you know, things like that I think can be uh, influence your attitude about a project. I'm not project, I'm sorry, I, uh, <laughs> a product. You also have this idea of peer pressure. So, you know, how your peers look at you. Um, and then things like, you know, family. So family uh, can influence you with recommendations. You know, here's dad cooking with uh, his kids and, you know, he would say things like, well, gee, I'm uh, gonna use this pan because it's, you know, nonstick and it's easy to clean up and easy to cook stuff. and. Uh, or it might be just the choice of, um, you know, the components of the meal. We're going vegetarian or, um, you know, it looks like it's going to be a nice healthy meal there. So certainly these uh, kind of cultural things that are built in from uh, peers or family or teachers, you know, that would uh, help to influence your decisions later. Okay, so cultural decisions, uh, obviously marketers, you know, think about things culturally. I mentioned the Nova before, um, but, you know, certain markets obviously have certain things, you know, there's McDonald's all over the place, there's Coke all over the place, maybe the recipes are a little different, uh, but there are certain markets also that, um, you know, have certain things that uh, you wouldn't see in other markets, like so, for instance, 
maybe somewhere where they grow a lot of coconuts, um, you might have uh, a lot of things in the market for opening coconuts or uh, cooking with coconuts or you know making coconut milk or whatever it is so um, it, it could be a geographic thing like that it could be a cultural thing uh, where you know you're trying to uh, kind of service that market and the other thing is you know thinking today about a global market kind of cross culturally marketing something so getting people to uh, you know uh, like a product that you know maybe in the USA everybody loves it but you know when we try to bring it to Europe or Africa um, people are like taken aback like oh well, you know what is that what do I need it for so again the brand has to educate people or persuade them that they do need to use the product okay and then um, you know the idea of multi attributions uh, and beliefs here so, you know, uh, okay, Tide's great, it cleans good, but here's a new thing, it's also green, right? It's sustainable. So, uh, you know, this other thing of, you know, kind of greenwashing all these products where, you know, they're just adding another kind of attribute on there. Um, so it's not only, you know, Coke, but it's also Diet Coke, but it's also sustainable, and it's green Coke, and, you know, you've got all those things that kind of come together and you know certainly sustainability is a big factor or attribute that uh, brands would uh, at least know that your consumer is conscious of so um, you know again lots of different things are going in there I listed some here so you know maybe we're looking back at the car choice you know its price its style its color its the reviews it's the size do I want the you know the four seater or the seven seater or the two seater you know is it sustainable is it durable is it cool is it healthy what's the brand's reputation so there's lots of things that I'm gonna kind of be influenced by here as a consumer uh, in this you know kind of idea of putting it all together as an equation how we kind of you know weight all those things and balance them into our final purchase decision pretty complicated right um, again attitudes I think again this is really one of the strong points that a marketer could have and um, you know Michelin has this great ad where they uh, say you know so much is riding on your tires and they got the baby there so you know this is really important uh, maybe it's you know changing someone's belief saying you know this new product is going to give you a whiter smile uh, or adding new attributes like we looked at you know Clorox is good for bleaching out stains but it's also green um, and then changing brand perception so you might have a car that seems like you know regular you know kind of you know practical car but now all of a sudden you know it uh, is on the racetrack next to a race car and it can go just as fast you know zero to sixty in two seconds or something like that so you didn't know that gee you know I didn't know Toyotas could do that you know maybe maybe I'll get one so this idea of you know brand loyalty um, you know that you are in the tribe and uh, a lot of you mentioned that you know Apple was one of your favorite brands and you know for many reasons obviously you know you can expect Apple's products to be technologically superior and um, therefore Apple can make their prices superior um, and as long as they perform well enough in the market they'll have that brand loyalty and be able to keep that price point up like that uh, here's another example here Levi's you know and you know this idea again of kind of like just the brand image and um, you know this kind of uh, communication that Levi's is giving you what it's going to do for you the feel and look of it here are some uh, categories of brands that experience uh, loyalty over their competitors. I don't know why this laptop computer came out as the Microsoft Surface. I would think, well, probably, um, I don't know where this data is actually coming from, but it's a little old. So, uh, but, you know, the idea of, you know, being the leader in the market and, you know, if you are, um, you know, just starting out in the market, how are you going to compete? Like, okay, I'm, I'm going to make my new sneakers, but how am I going to compete with somebody like Nike? And, uh, you know, I've obviously got to, you know, kind of look at what they're doing that's working and think about how I can do it on my much smaller scale and budget. Um, okay, post-purchase evaluation. 
I, I, I think I'm going to use this as the uh, discussion for uh, this one. So, you know, I mean, I know you guys uh, have seen a lot of this stuff, so um, you want to make sure that you kind of service it also. So it's not just, you know, buy and forget about it. You know, you want to make sure that there's satisfaction um, and that you support the consumer. You know, it might be something like, um, you know, how-to how video that shows them how best to use it, best practices. Um, cognitive dissonance is this idea like, gee, after I bought it, I was just like, gee, did I make the right decision? I don't know, you know. Uh, especially with a big ticket item like a car, you know, you, you, you don't really know until you start, you know, driving it, put some mileage on it, get a real feel for it. Did you make the right choice? So post-purchase uh, communication here is really important. So I'm going to pose that to you guys as the discussion question. Um, obviously, you know, you know, lots of ways to do it and, you know, think about uh, what those ways are and what would be like the most uh, effective ways to kind of uh, service the consumer with post-purchase communications. Okay, so let's look at this one for a second. I'm just going to refresh my memory here. I think this is really a review to, I talked a little bit about new brands getting into the market and, you know, how um, it's going to be a real challenge for them to get into that evoked set, right? Where, you know, they would be considered as one of the choices right away. Uh, I think Hyundai did a good job with that, you know, when they came online that, you know, they uh, were at the right price point, but yet performance was good. And, you know, when you were thinking, oh, maybe, you know, Honda, Toyota, Hyundai came to mind right away too in that Evoke set. Um, so habitual purchases, um, actually, I'm, I didn't want to go to that one yet, but the idea of a habitual uh, purchase like, gee, I don't even think about it in the morning when I go and get my Starbucks coffee or I get it from the, you know, uh, stand outside or whatever. Um, but if I'm buying something big like a new car and it's the first time I bought a new car, then it's going to take me a lot longer to kind of go through these phases, right? And you know, make the decision. I'm not just going to just walk in and just buy any car where I might do that with a cup of coffee, uh, but I'm certainly not going to do it, you know, with my new, you know, whatever it is, BMW. Um, so this one is this idea of conditioning. I thought I had the, the doggy one first here. So, but the idea of, you know, a conditioned response, right? So, um, you know, if you think about a lollipop, it's an unconditioned uh, stimulus. You see it, all of a sudden you taste it, gee, it's sweet. And then you think about Mariah's perfume and, uh, you know, now every time you see a lollipop, you think that um, the perfume and then you, you know, associate the sweetness with the perfume. Um, this was really supposed to come up first, I'm sorry. The idea of conditioning. So, you know, the classical Pavlov's dog, right? The dog sees the food, it's an unconditioned stimulus, and, uh, you know, they salivate. So now all of a sudden we ring a bell, it has nothing to do with anything, the dog does not salivate. But later on, we ring a bell and give the dog food, and we keep doing that, ring the bell to give the dog food. Now we just ring the bell and the dog salivates. So this idea that there's this condition response. So now you see the lollipop and you think right away um, of the sweetness of the perfume instead of just the sweetness of the lollipop. Bling. Um, I don't know why that, that actually came up twice. Got to edit a little more carefully. So here's the thing, um, a concept like instrumental conditioning. So the idea that, you know, I bought the product, um, positive or negative. So it could be something like, gee, when I use this, I looked great. Or it could be something like, gee, when I use this, it gave me a rash. So, you know, is it positive? Is it negative? And then, you know, how is that going to influence my next decision when I go to buy the same type of product? And we're almost done here. So um, this idea of schedules of reinforcement uh, and shaping. So this is very key, actually. And the idea, you know, I mentioned that, you know, you need to have a campaign that's running. So you need to buy uh, time in a kind of schedule so that you can be top of mind. Uh, sometimes it gets monotonous, right? You know, a lot of times in certain media, you hear the same commercial over and over again, right? If you, I, I notice it a lot of times on internet radio. 
was, and I'm like, you know, how many times are you going to play the same commercial? It gets a little bit, you know, I just change the station after a while. Uh, and then there's the idea of shaping. So shaping might be something like a free trial. So uh, it starts out totally free, but then, uh, you know, you got to pay next time, right? So there's some kind of obligation built in. Or they send you a free sample, okay? So here's a free sample. Now I've got it free, and I've got a coupon that says 50% off, right? Now I go to the store, and I buy the item, and I get another coupon as a receipt, but this one is only for 25% off. And eventually, hopefully for the advertiser, I've become accustomed to the product and buying it. Now I have to buy it at full price. Okay, so this idea of kind of weaning people into the product, right? With some type of offer in the beginning, but then uh, cutting back so that, you know, they would have to actually pay full price. I hope you enjoyed today's lecture on consumer behavior and let me know if you have any questions. The assignments are posted in Blackboard. Please send me your topic if you haven't because I'm missing some of them. They were due last night.